Hey everybody out there in YouTube land, this is Jen and welcome to a very special Halloween edition of Jen's Reviews from the Grave. And today we're uh, Booze and Ghouls, we'll be talking about why sometimes dead is better. Uh, we'll be talking about 1989's Mary Lambert's classic, Pet Cemetery. So if you want to hear my thoughts on Pet Cemetery, stick around. Pet Cemetery. It is no uh, no secret on this channel that I am a massive. This is my favorite uh, Stephen King book of all time, and it is in my top five of favorite uh, horror movies of of all time. I, I I simply adore this movie, and um I I'm here kind of to make a little bit of a rebuttal because I've heard a lot of people and a lot of and people do give praise. People do love this movie, but there's also a lot of uh, things that people really I think frankly shit on that I don't agree with that I just want to sit here and talk to you guys about and give you my thoughts and if you don't happen to agree with my thoughts that's totally cool I'm not saying my thoughts are better than anybody else's I am not gonna go too heavily into the story about Pet Cemetery, but I will give you a brief uh, just a very brief little by the numbers for anyone who hasn't seen it and for anyone who hasn't seen it please just stop this review and watch it don't listen to some asshole just giving you the cliff notes of the movie movie this is a movie you should experience and um, so just if you have if you haven't never seen this movie go see it read the book and then come back if you want to um, basically the story of, of of the creeds is Rachel Lewis Ellie Gage Judd and Pascal and how their lives have all intersect Rachel and Lewis are married Rachel has a very tragic backstory uh, where she's had to deal with death and um, she's phobic she had to deal with death at a very early age and she's phobic and she just anything with death she wants to completely pretend it's not there it, it's not coming into this house she even marries a doctor because I think she thinks that's an added layer of protection that death will not dare come around her or her children if she has a doctor to keep it at bay we have a uh, uh, Lewis Creed who's just a happy family man who who loves his wife and his kids and you know it but is a pretty practical man and you would think out of everything that is to come in this movie he would be best equipped to handle what is to come and yet he is the one that completely falls apart not that you could blame him and then you have these two adorable children Ellie and we also have and of course and I won't be the first person nor the last person to comment on this but it's a Stephen King story folks and Ellie is basically our psychic kid um, there's that is a trope with King we all know this anyone who's read a handful of his books know that that especially during that time Stephen King King like to have a psychic kid or not even necessarily a psychic kid but a psychic something but usually a psychic kid and um it, and she is basically there to kind of to, to set things in motion with her cat and also there to you know to communicate with Pascal toward the end we also have Pascal who again it's very Shakespearean like I said earlier in this review it's very Shakespearean Pascal is is somebody there trying to do something Lewis has d tried to do something for him and now he's trying to pay it forward and at the end his all of his attempts no matter how valiant they are completely fail and crumble and then we have Judd and like I said I'm not going to talk too much about Judd but he is he is that he is their next door neighbor he's the one who introduces uh, uh Lewis to all the trouble and um and he and he and he's the one who gets sets this all in motion for all I know I may you can be responsible for the death of your son. Judge, you're talking crazy. You're thinking of putting him up there. Don't deny the thought hadn't crossed your mind, Lewis. Because I introduced you to the power, and he tells the story about Timmy Baderman, and um, he's uh, Judd is also because Lewis uh, in the book Lewis basically says that Judd should have been his father. He never knew his father the the middle of his life, and um, they have a very intense bond. And uh, Fred Gwynne, uh, who embodies Judd Crandall so well, I mean, we can see Judd as someone. We all want Judd to be our father. We all want uh, Judd to be our uncle. Um, and Judd is also a little dangerous because. Because although you don't think he is a bad man, you know, he, he knew deep down in his bones, he knows 
what's going to happen. He tells uh, J uh, Lewis the story about bringing his dog back and how that didn't turn out too well. And um, and but he knows, and yet knowing these what has happened and what have happened with other people, he still sets it in motion again. And it, it brings up the thing: is this? Um, it, it seems to be a power that's stronger than any person's will because basically Judd's a good guy and yet he he spills the beans he just because you have to it goes more in the book but the movie but the movie hits the right notes for you guys to get the general idea and the general picture of what is going on um but but the, yeah so we have this whole cast of characters and it's just amazing and and it's about and we and we lose uh, it's about death it's about how a parent copes with losing a child it is about the decisions you make and it's also toward the end of the of the movie it's also uh, this is another thing that i think people don't touch on either this is um about not only about grief and loss but it's about not appreciating what you do have because in the movie and i believe in the book too judd goes you know you still have a daughter lewis um and 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 lewis kind of forgets you know he is so uh, all consumed with gage he forgets that yes but at least he still has a wife and daughter and even though the life that they had is shattered beyond all repair they can still take those uh, sh those sh those uh, glass shards and and maybe not make the same picture but could make a picture and find some joint happiness never be the same again but can still go you know what I st at least I'm not alone I still have a wife I still have a daughter I could find my way back to happiness but because uh, Lewis doesn't focus on that and I'm not judging Lewis don't think I'm judging Lewis on this because God forbid anybody have to walk in his shoes but 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 because he is not seeing the whole picture because his eyes are so clouded with grief he misses out he 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 basically he basically because he refuses to let go of something that's already gone he loses the two things he still had and and that's a hell of a I mean think about that that is that is a hell of a thing to do and it, it's a it, it's a point that I don't think um is ever gotten made we always focus on the loss and grief but we never focus on what's right in front of us and you know what sometimes in life you just got to take happiness wherever you can find it you got to make and it's easier said than done especially losing a child and please don't think i'm being cavalier and like oh you got two of them you know if you lose one you still got a, an heir and a spare if you will no i'm not saying that but i'm just saying better to still have something and to put all of that love in on the what you have left than to just lose everything and have nothing when you still had something if that makes sense but that's a point i've never heard anybody else talk about and i feel that that's just as important as the loss and grief of this book is to remember hey no matter how bad it is and even if you have nothing even if you're a person who didn't have a wife and another child you could you, you know you never know hope can come and come in very unexpected places and if you just hold on for one more day maybe you'll find something that will never replace what you lost but can fight but can maybe help heal some of the wounds put a bomb on your wounded heart if you will um so the, so that is basically the the very basic premise story of of pet cemetery and now i would like to delve into the actual characters of the story but, um, i'm going to get to a big controversial opinion here and this is one that just pisses me off every time i hear it no matter if it's a friend say i hear it say or some uh big big hot shot uh horror aficionado will tell me uh you know what really brings down the movie jen is uh is uh lewis creed's perf uh the performance uh, of lewis creed played by dale medcalf people for some reason hate Del Medcast's performance in this and I could not disagree with you guys more respectfully mind you but I, I, I it pisses me off if I'm going to be completely honest with you guys it pisses me off when I hear people say that his performance sucked because uh, he you know Fred Gwynney's gold and he and he and his performance is what it is but it's but 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 uh Del Medcast's performance is almost as damn good as uh as Fred Gwynney's performance is Judd I mean he per portrays grief. There is something so melancholy about that actor. There's a darkness in that actor. Um, even when and when, even when we're not getting into the horror yet, there is something about him. I had actually seen Del Medcalf in a uh, movie for uh, from the TV of the week, uh, Cries, uh, Cry for Help, the Tracy Thurman story. <laughs> Help
There, there are so many in this movie, but the one that I, and I don't hear this scene get talked about a lot, is the funeral scene where uh, Lewis is, you know, the worst day of his life, looks like he's sleepwalking, and he gets in a fight with his father-in-law. And in the, in the movie, it touches on it. In the book, you go in a lot more about how Lewis's father-in-law pretty much hated Lewis from the start, thought he was trash, um, even though he became a doctor. Most parents, I guess that's their dreams for their daughters, to dr marry a doctor. He just saw Lewis from the, because Lewis didn't come from money. Lewis uh, grew up on the poor side of the tracks, and uh, the father just thought that their, his little girl deserved so much better than what she got. And on the day of the funeral, uh, tensions, and that's, and it's again, it's very much into human insight, because at the funeral, when we're, we all, as humans, it is, we are designed to like try to explain the unexplainable away. So, I mean, there's got to be a reason for something, whether it's good or bad. You always wonder the well, okay, why A, B, C. We have to make we have to make an equation to make sense out of tragedy, even though, and by all rights and logic, you cannot do that. And uh, Lewis's father, uh, Lewis's uh, uh, father-in-law comes up to Lewis, and um, I, I guess this is where some people, will, there are so many in this movie, but the one that I, and I don't hear this scene get talked about a lot, is the funeral scene, where uh, Lewis is, you know, the worst day of his life, looks like he's sleepwalking, and he gets in a fight with his father-in-law, and in the, in the movie, it touches on it, in the book, you go in a lot more about how Lewis's father-in-law pretty much hated Lewis from the start, thought he was trash, um, even though he became a doctor. Most parents, I guess that's their dreams for their daughters, to dr marry a doctor. He just saw Lewis from the, because Lewis didn't come from money. Lewis uh, grew up on the poor side of the tracks, and uh, the father just thought that their, his little girl deserved so much better than what she got. And on the day of the funeral, uh, tensions, and that's, and it's again, it's very much into human insight, because at the funeral, when we're, we all, as humans, it is we are designed to like try to explain the unexplainable away so I mean there's got to be a reason for something whether it's good or bad you always wonder the well, okay why a b c we have to make we have to make an equation to make sense out of tragedy even though and by all rights and logic you cannot do that and uh Lewis's father uh Lewis's uh, uh father-in-law comes up to Lewis, and um, I, I guess this is where some people will find this very heavily melodramatic, bordering, bordering, bordering on a soap opera kind of uh, of situation. You kill her, Daddy! Ellie. a big scene. It's not a very big scene that the this movie has a lot of scenes that by themselves they're not particularly big or flashy, but they say a lot. And in, and in this scene, it shows a lot about human emotion and how humans react. And we're always looking for something in tragedy. It's got to be somebody's fault. It, sometimes things just happen because they happen because they happen. And there's absolutely no rhyme or reason. And But there's a part of us that will never believe that. We, it's, it's somebody's fault. It's somebody's fault. And that's one of the reasons why both the book and the movie is such is so poignant, is so telling, because it shows us in our rawest, rawest format, our most primal, primal, primal way of being, and um, it's not always a pretty picture. And it, it's just a brilliant scene, and I love it. And it get, again, it's a very small scene. It's not very big, but it helps draw a huge picture. Also, also another person who doesn't get a lot of love in this film uh, in this film is uh, Denise Crosby as Rachel. And again, I don't. Uh, people have said that she is a very unlikable character. And I don't get that. I see her as a very broken character. She, before the movie even starts, already has the backstory of having to see uh, a, someone she loved died. And she had to confront death at a lot earlier age that most of us don't even have to even think about. Don't even know what death means. Don't really even understand what death means. She has to, she has to deal with that. And because of, of certain things that have happened in her life, she has, has, has almost become phobic when it comes to death. Death. And um, she she she's pretty really I really like her and there and she doesn't have as much of a presence.
presence as Lewis or, or Judge in this movie. It's not it, it's not so much her story as it is Lewis's. But when she, when she does get scenes, she's really good. The scene where they're at they're in the pet cemetery for the first time, and Judd takes Ellie to the pet cemetery, and um and she just give and she keeps giving Lewis these looks, and it's like and again it's something we're all very relatable to. When you're in a relationship, uh, you know there's just certain things you don't go. There are certain things you don't touch even you know with your partner. And Lewis knows that he that, that, that this is something he just better just shut the fuck up and let her um, because uh, Judd tells her, well, they have to learn about death sometime, don't they, Mrs. Great? And she just goes, why? And she kind of throws Lewis lo a look uh, at Lewis and she goes, can I have the baby? And it, it, it's a very simple scene, but it says so much about their relationship and it says a lot about, it says, it, it sets up, even if we didn't have the scene with Zelda, we know that this woman has a horrible, horrible uh, just almost a phobia of death and it's a very simple scene but it's done brilliantly and Denise Crosby also brings her A game um, like I said it's not so much her story as it is Lewis's but you still get it and what I like about this film is it shows you would think that it would be Lewis would be the strong one and it would be Rachel's uh, uh, one to go into madness but somehow she finds an inner strength that she doesn't have and she's actually able to cope with it as, as well as you can under those circumstances and she's actually the stronger one. She's the one that uh, that that uh, that actually uh, you know is 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 the one that's able to kind of go. Okay, you know we this this is this is a nightmare, but we got to build. We and our house is basically burned down. Our lives will never be the same. But we got to pick up and try to figure out. And we got to remember we have a daughter. Um, it, it's just it's just so good and I just think these two actors do not get enough love because there are so many good scenes um, in this in this movie that just show show showcases the highlight and the depth of their acting and it, it just really pisses me off that they don't get much love I I can understand why everyone loves Fred Gwynny and he deserves every bit of that love but I just it does I don't get why that they don't get as much love as Fred Gwynny uh, speaking of an other acting choices and again you, this is another thing where you got to tip your hat off to Mary Lambert um, is uh, the casting of Zelda and this is another thing that I hear all horror fans say that Zelda was something that was nightmare fuel for most for most kids in my generation about my age group uh, was the Zelda scene um, I'm going to twist your back like mine so you'll never get out of bed again <laughs> never get out of bed again never get out of bed again it didn't particularly scare me as a kid. It didn't, um, but I was one of those kids that knew that could understand reality and, and fantasy from a very young age. It's a creepy scene, but it never gave me nightmares. But I've heard many a horror fan say that the scene with Zelda just, I mean, gave them nightmares for years. And one of the things that Mary Lambert did, and again, uh, uh, originally it was just they had cast a woman to play Zelda, but she said, you know what, I want there to be something else uh, extra about Zelda. I want there to be something just that's uh, that's off about her but you don't know what it is but you can still feel it and then she got the brilliant idea of you know what let's cast a man in as a, and put him in you know a woman cast a man to play a woman and it does it does give that little bit of sense of throwing off and I really like that and I think that's maybe one of the reasons why uh, Zelda was such a nightmare fuel with her twisted back um, I and again you just have to give it up to Mary Lambert I, I, I really don't think she gets enough credit for how many right choices she made in this movie. Speaking of Mary Lambert, um, she is someone who I feel doesn't get enough love and, 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 and enough uh, respect for because she really made some choices that made the film better. In fact, everyone's favorite part of the movie, which is universally whether you love this movie or hate this movie, one thing I, I've never heard anyone say is that Fred Gwynne doesn't give the most brilliant performance probably in horror history. It's per my personal favorite uh, portrayal of a horror character in any movie ever. It's just, I, I mean, he and bodies Judd Crandall to a T and the studio did not want Fred Gwynne. They said mm -mm, we don't think this is the right fit um, because before uh, Pet Cemetery fame what most people knew Fred Gwynne for With Dr. Frankenstein is where my story starts. Everything I have may not be mine but I'm a gentleman of parts And the studio said mm -mm, 
We think we think people, the audience, will look at him and see uh, see uh, Herman Monster and won't take the seriousness of Judd. They they won't take Judd seriously. And uh, Mary Lambert just had a gut instinct and she had to fight him pretty hard. And she's like, no, this is who I want. And somehow she managed to ramrod it to where Fred Gwynne would get the part. And could you imagine? I mean, sit back and think if any other actor had that role of Judd Crandall, I don't think that it would work as well. And I know a lot of people who who are not as big a fans of this movie as I am would say it would be a total unwatchable mess. Now, I don't agree with that, but I can't imagine anybody else in the role. He gives one of the most brilliant performances just ever I've seen. It is the gold standard for me uh, for for performances in horror movies. Um, uh, but she, but it was Mary Lambert who made that call. If she had listened to the studio, it could be a com it would have been a completely different movie and probably not near as uh, near as beloved as it is, even with all the detractors. Uh, Mary Lambert also had to go to bat pretty hard for Miko Hughes. The for the casting of Ellie, they they did twins, which is pretty common. I think even today, it's more cost effective, and they wanted to do the same thing with Gage. They wanted to uh, do a set of actors that were twins. Um, it's just it's just easier on the production, cost effective, all that. And she saw an audition for Miko Hughes, and even though he was only three years old, she goes, "This kid has a shine about him. This kid is as much Gage as uh, Fred Gwynne is our." Judd and again she had to go to bat for him and she got him and uh, what another thing people always talk about is how cute Gage is. I've, I've never heard a horror fan that just you know didn't absolutely love Gage whether he was the sweet little boy flying the kite or the little bastard demon from hell that's trying to you know kills his mother fucking you know kills uh, Judd and then also uh, tries to kill his father. Um, we all we just love little Gage. He is absolutely just adorable and he is much gay and Miko Hughes is as much gauge as Fred Gwynne was Judd and again that was all the due to the credit of Mary Lambert and um, she was just at the um, and before she got into Pet Cemetery, she had been mostly known uh, for doing music videos and there is a certain stylistic choices and things that yeah that 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 are very much you would see in a, uh, mu uh, a music video as she uh, directed a, Madonna, a couple of Madonna's videos and some other big names in fact how they got the Ramones to do a song for the soundtrack is she had done a couple of videos for them and she was able to get in contact with them and also it was also because Stephen King that was one of his favorite bands but they I think it was a lot easier for them to get a hold of the Ramones because she kind of had their number because she had worked with them a few times and that's another thing that uh, it's universally loved that song is a for especially horror fans is a universally loved song of uh, of, of horror fans you know you start humming a few bars of that and any horror fan worth their salt will you know sing we'll have a big sing-along very easily a big sing-along and um uh, except for Ramones fans I've heard that your hardcore Ramones fans don't like it because and it, even though it was their biggest hit it was like I think it was their highest scoring thing on Billboard charts um but again all of these things if it hadn't been Mary Lambert at the helm some of the things that people say are the best parts of this movie are things that if it had been any other director it might have been a totally different movie so I'm just gonna uh, so right there I'm just gonna give some love to Mary Lambert because she she really made Made some great choices and the movie could have been a completely different different beast had she not made the choices she had made also another thing about this movie that I think we should talk about is I this movie made me understand as a kid uh, the be this is the best expl explanation uh, of death to, to, to anyone I've ever heard, uh, the scene where where uh, where after she goes to the pet cemetery, Ellie uh, her, uh, is starting to think about mortality and that one day maybe uh, a church is going to die. Which also, can we all just say that Winston Churchill is like the best name for a cat ever? I've always loved that name. Um, but she's starting to think that one day he might have to go to the pet cemetery, and she goes. And I also like that she instinctively knows to go to Lewis because even she at this young age knows that. Rachel's not really comfortable with this idea so she has to go in fact in the book it goes a little bit more in depth that 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 Lewis was kind of resentful because uh, you know she, uh, the kind of relationship Ellie has with her parents she'll go and ask uh, Rachel how many uh, pieces of uh, you know some uh, she'll go ask Rachel you know something a softball question but she comes to Lewis for the hard truths and he kind of a little bit of a resentment there and I, I like that is in parenthood that's kind of that's that's true you you know, sometimes uh, one parent gets the hardball questions and the other one doesn't. And she comes and she uh, she she asks what happens when you die. 
And uh, and he goes, well, no one really knows, sweetheart. And, and in the book, he gives the analogy of a burglar, of a chair burglar, and, and that's how he's explaining faith. And I, I know that sounds silly, but if you've read the book, you'll understand what I mean. But basically, in the movie, he does it's it, that's cut out, and he's just like, well, we know one of two things. Either um, some people believe we just wink out like a candle flame when the wind blows hard, and there's just, you know, nothing. It's just like the lights go out, and there's no more or we go on and how we go on or where do we go on to or what we go on to nobody really knows uh, but it's, it's one of those choices it's either absolutely nothing or something and um, I, I and um, you know people have all kinds of ideas and people who have very strong faith think they know but th they don't they just really believe that that's what's gonna happen but do they absolutely know no they don't and I thought that that is the best way to explain death to a kid that there either is it's it, it, either way there's nothing to be afraid of because you're either it's either gonna be nothing and it's just nothing or you're gonna go on and maybe you get what you believe or maybe you you get it turned into a turtle <laughs> you know it just it just you it's just wait it's just it's it's open to every possibility or it's absolutely nothing and to me that was the that that was the best way to explain something to uh, the it, that was the best way to explain death to a kid or to anybody and I've always loved that um, again it's it, it, it's very simplified but it's not talking down to a kid or to anybody else Okay, another another big player of this movie is the character of Pascal. And basically, Pascal is the young man that Lewis tries to save. He gets hit by a, a truck while jogging. They bring him in. Lewis knows there's absolutely nothing. And in the book, in the movie, basically his brains are hanging out of his head. And there's, there's nothing. Even if they were at the hospital, there was nothing that they could do to this poor kid. But Lewis sits there and be, and so he's not alone. He doesn't die alone. He, you know, he tells him it's going to be okay and everything else. And then we have this scene where, you know, right before Pascal dies, you know, I'll come to you. And again, I guess some people would say that's over the top and hokey. But, you know, who who's any of us to say about the supernatural land? Um, and, it, and I think Pascal does a wonderful job. And Pascal is a, much like Lewis and everybody else in this whole in this whole movie. All these characters are really very flawed characters. Uh, 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 Pascal is basically just trying to do something kind for Lewis because Lewis was there when he when he when he when he was making his transition. He's trying to help Lewis. He says, you know, the the destruction of the of, of yourself and those you hold dear is very near. And and uh, and he's trying and and all he wants to do is help Lewis to, to not make a bad situation even worse. And every time he tries to help Lewis, it just blows up in his face because Lewis isn't listening to him. Even though uh, Pascal is, you know, literally coming from beyond to say, look, dude, you know, I know this seems like a good idea. I know this all makes sense, but trust me, this is only going to lead the, 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 the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And that's literally the embodiment of Pascal. He is trying to do good and he is being fucked every step of the way. Lewis won't listen to him, and you kind of wonder if the power of uh, of the of the pet cemetery or what lies beyond the pet cemetery is maybe uh, you know doing is going to battle with Pascal. Um, and, and he's just he's and also the makeup effects for the time of the '80s. I loved his makeup effects in it. Um, I think they still hold up even today. Um, but the last scene where he. I'm sorry, Lewis. I'm so sorry. But don't make it worse. Don't. I waited too long with Gage. With Rachel. It will work this time. Because she just died. She just died a little while ago. Lewis! Don't! Please! Lewis! No! no more helping Lewis. There's no more clapping. You know how you say if you clap loud enough the, the fairies will come back in Peter Pan. Don't matter how much clapping you're going to get for Lewis. He, he's gone. He's, he's in the land of he's in a different land. He's in the, he's in the land where he's never coming back. Um, and it's, it's very, tra it's a tragedy. Again, it's a tragedy for the, for Pascal's soul to try to do something, to try to help, to try to do, bring good and try to make the situation not get any worse than it already is. And he fails every step.
step of the way. And a lot of people for, seem to forget about Pascal. And some people will say that he is pointless. I think he was pointless in the remake because he's there and hardly ever. But in, in, in this, in the 1989 Mary Lambert's version, I think he is very much needed. And he actually, he enhances the story. He adds the own little flavor of the story. And it's very a bitter and tragic uh, flavor that he adds to it. But I would definitely say, some people would say you could totally cut out Pascal and it wouldn't matter. I would respectfully disagree with all of that. Even you can't defend the law of that, that scene where Lewis is putting down church and he says to Today is Thanksgiving Day for cats. But only if they came back from the dead. Actually, I can um, because I just it just gives us another glimpse into Lewis's broken and shattered mind. I mean, he has gone into the land of the loony, and I don't think I think it's a permanent vacation there at this point. I don't think anything's ever going to bring him back. Final thoughts on Pet Cemetery, and there is so much. I feel like this is this review has not done the movie justice. I feel part of me wants to redo this uh, this this review and go point by point by point, but uh, the, but I mean that's not what I do. What I do is try to bring out information that not everyone has told you a hundred times and give you my thoughts and what emotions and what thoughts this brings out in me and my own personal thing. And um, I, this is a genius movie. This is a genius movie. I think every Everybody in this film is top-notch acting. I, I do, and I feel that Mary Lambert does not get enough credit, that this is a perfect film. If you want a raw study on grief, loss, and what, and maybe rem remind yourself, you know, what you can hold on or and appreciate what you have. And again, easier said than done. Easier said than done. I would never, if I was in a fucking jury, I would never convict Lewis because I feel like I would probably be Lewis. I, especially the scene that I really identify with is the scene where uh, Pascal is after he loses, after he puts down Gage and Rachel is dead. That, spoilers by the way, but I warned you in the beginning so I can't, so you guys can't get mad at me. But when Rachel is dead um, and he and Pascal's going, you know, Lewis, no. And uh, he goes, it'll work this time. I just, she just died a little while ago. And I know people mock that scene, but that scene to me, I understand it as crazy it is, even though he had just seen the results of what happens when you fuck where you shouldn't be fucking around. He still, he, he still thinks in his crazy broken mind, it isn't the place that's bad. I just didn't use the place in the right way. It has to, she has to have died right now. We can still get her soul back and it'll be Rachel this time. And that scene is probably my favorite damn scene of the whole movie. It, and I love the way, again, gotta, gotta tip my hat to Del Medcalf. I love the way it'll work this time. And it's such a crazy but earnest way he, he, he delivers that line like like half of my mind the, the the little bit of rational part of my mind that I have like it's like no dude and then the other part I'm like you know what Lewis you're right maybe that is it it's it's not so much the place it's just we haven't figured out how to use the place right yet and um, it, it's an amazing scene and probably my favorite scene of the whole movie and 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 you just it, it's I've never and I, I think the reason why the remake didn't work as well as is it did is because it brings out emotions in people and you can call it hammy you can call it overacting but to me it hit every mark and it hit it perfect right dead center of the target um i can't sing a movie of this is enough praises and as much as i love fred gwenny i think everyone else deserved a little bit of shout outs and a little bit of love and maybe watch this movie again and maybe not see that this isn't a hammy over dramatic mess this is this is just a raw a raw the rawest portrayal of human emotions the the ugly side of the human emotion it runs the gamut and it hits you where you live um, and I and if you're asking me should you see Pet Cemetery yes if you've seen Pet Cemetery you should see it again um, you, you should because this is this is one of those films that for me is perfect and um, again this, these are just my thoughts I, I can I can understand if some people will go no this is just a schlocky over over hype mess with a with with Fred Gwynnie being the only saving grace um, I don't agree with that but I can respectfully disagree to disagree with you on this but for me this is an a plus movie it is a classic it is always in my top five of favorite horror movies of all time this is a movie that will never change uh, i did a, a top hundred horror mo favorite 100 movies a couple a while back and just over the few years that i've done that from now um 
there's some movies that I would take away and add on, but Pet Cemetery is one that would always be in the very top five of the thing, and it would always and it would never be off my list because the performances and it's not just Fred Gwynny. As good as Fred Gwynny is, that's not the only reason it has to be on my list. And I, I, I just it really angers me when I think of everybody else who put so much in and made this movie so special and they get shit on. It I just don't like it. It's just it's a pet peeve. It's been bugging me. <laughs> um, but the, the, as always, booze and ghouls, those are just my opinions and what the hell do I know? I'm just some asshole with an internet channel. Um, but de yes, I definitely think you should see Pet Cemetery. I think it's, it's my classic. I think you should show, uh, when they're old enough to show your children. And it also is general horror. I mean, there are some scenes that, I mean, I find it funny that everybody says this movie's so bad, yet this is a movie that I hear, oh, that movie Zelda gave me nightmare fuel, or, you know, the, everyone knows well you don't go down that road I can't do a main accent but you know it's funny to me everyone has all these problems with this movies yet everyone knows these scenes there has to be some competency somewhere and it can't all fall on Fred Gwynny's shoulders that's all I'm saying and with that booze and ghouls I'm gonna take my leave and just say go wish you guys a very happy Halloween I feel like this review did not did not hit the mark where I'd like to I feel like I this review does did not do this movie justice but I really tried guys I've been trying to make this review for a couple of years now and if I didn't get it done now I never would so uh, if this review sucks my apologies but I really tried I really tried so with all that out of the way booze and ghouls I thank you so much for watching I hope you have a fantastic Halloween and um oh and we'll be on the Halloween hoot nanny tonight so uh, if you're free around 12 o'clock come down to the hoot nanny and see what Christian and I are gonna be doing I'll talk to you real soon happy Halloween guys and thanks so much for watching Bye.